All right, Danny. All right, so we talk about Olenek, right? Yes. Let's talk about Hunt. Let's talk about Hunt. Play it. Hey, my name is Aaron. I'm calling from Montreal. Uh, just wondering, what do you guys think is next for Mark Hunt after uh, the submission loss to Olenek? Uh, he seems to still be in great shape, fighting great at 44. He seems that he can still hang and bang with the best in the world. Got caught in a submission by Olenek, but... Uh, What's next for him? Should he wait for uh, Ngannou to see what happens there? Um, what do you guys think? Thanks. Yeah, good call. Good call. You know what I think, Danny? He's still ranked around eight. Now, he might drop, so he might be somewhere around the top ten, depending on how the rankings go. And, again, everyone's going to dispute, oh, the rankings. He belongs X and not Y position. I'm only using ten as, like, let's say a rough placeholder. Maybe it's nine. Maybe it's 11 or 12. Let's just see. But uh, my point would be um, – what about a fight against Tai Tuivasa, right? The pride of uh, New Zealand versus the pride of Australia, something like that. Or no, you guys, you know, sort of two guys with the same background, basically. Uh, aren't they? Aren't they uh, related? If I'm not mistaken, they might be. I think All they the are. Better. Or, or is that with Tyson Pedro? Uh, you know, I can't even remember anymore. I can't keep it straight. He's been a sparring partner with him forever, so they probably wouldn't. But I'm just saying that to me, I always love those kinds of stories mm -hmm. where there's like a familial or camp relation and whether or not they'll do it. So let's say you could exclude that. You could still do, um, I guess you could do Arlovsky. You could do Tybora, something like that. Maybe maybe you could, well, Verdum's going to be out for two years, so you couldn't do that. But yeah. somewhere in that space, a Struve rematch, I guess if you wanted to. It really all depends. There's nothing quite obvious. But here's what I will say, Danny. Whoever the opponent is, is I'm not saying irrelevant. But look, he's going to finish out his UFC career, right? So what's going to happen? He's probably going to still hold positions like this, maintaining a spot as either a main or a co-main on cards overseas. Probably that's where you're going to see him. That's my hunch. What about you? Yeah, um, and I was just looking at the rankings. I mean, he's fought almost everybody in there. So, I mean, a lot of these fights would be rematches, and a lot of these guys are also booked. I, I guess the Andre Orlovsky one makes sense, and... Yeah, I guess for for the for the Oceania market, you know, he's still a very important asset and a, a very big name. And frankly, like, I know he's older and you know he's um, you know a, a bit on a downhill, but he, I don't get the sense of oh, this guy needs to retire as like no. some other guys. Like, no, no. he still looks game. You know, he can still he's, get he, a few wins for look, sure. Look, he landed a huge punch yeah. on Olenek, right? Like, yeah. that would have dropped a lot of guys. Olenek, you know, is is a tough tough guy, so he didn't. But yeah, you're right. I still think he's competitive for sure. Yeah. All right, should we go on next? Yes, let's please do that, Danny. Segura. Talking about older fighters, let's keep let's keep that conversation going. What's going on, Mr. Luke Thomas? Love the show, my man. My name is Charles Jalen. I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. My question is regarding to BJ Penn. What do you feel is the reason he is still fighting? Um, you think it's mental, or is he searching for past glory? I feel the last person to beat a prime BJ, in my opinion, was Frankie Edgar. Nowadays, he's just been losing left and right. And uh, do you feel that a prime BJ can hang with the 155s and 145s of today? Thanks, man. Great question. By the way, Danny, piece of trivia. Did you know that I went to high school in the Atlanta area? No, I did not. Yes, I did. I feel like we learned uh, something new about you every right. show. Shouts to everyone at Marietta High School. Uh, terrible school. <laughs> I learned next to nothing. No, I'm teasing. Uh, but, uh, yes, I went to high school outside the Atlanta area, Mary, which is Cobb County, which is right outside Fulton County. Fulton County is Atlanta. So, yes, in fact, I did. Um, you know, I asked Ryan Hall about it. If you're Ryan Hall, I understand why you want to take the fight, right? Because, yeah. A, a you've just been off for two years, right? you got to get back in there. That's number one. Number two, BJ Penn still has a big name. People care about BJ. He is a legend. He's a freaking Hall of Famer officially, right? Yep. And then three, look, I, I don't see how you can possibly argue he's not diminished. I, I just I just don't know how you – he hasn't won since 2010. Now, yeah. he did have a draw in that time, but he hasn't won since 2010. It's a long time, man. It's a long time. BJ was the first and probably the only fighter, Danny. I don't know how you feel about this. It's hard for me to watch him because – I used to idolize the guy, and I still do, about what he was able to accomplish. He could wrestle. He had a jab. Obviously, his jiu-jitsu was just out of this world. He was hard to hurt. He had a chin. I mean, he was everything. He was the perfect fighting machine for a time. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think he should be continuing to fight. I'm not a regulatory uh, officiant. I have no say over this. I don't say it out of hate. 
I don't say it out of a need to just bring down others. I say it out of total concern. Let me make one point, Danny, if I may. A lot of people say you can never tell another person when to retire, and that's true. I can't. I can't. I'm not someone's mother. I literally cannot make anybody stop. But if you sit in a chair like this or a chair like yours, Danny, or you have a microphone or there's a camera on your face, you also have a responsibility to say what you're seeing. And if someone is going too long, there's going to be a time where you have to say something. Now, you have to exercise some discretion, and you have to be very, very understanding of your own uh, limitations in terms of what you might see. But this notion that you just have to keep your mouth shut while somebody keeps yep. going, at some point it becomes unethical to do that. So that's not true. We just have to be careful about it. So what I'm saying is out of an abundance of care and appreciation for the career of BJ Penn, I don't think he can hang with the modern 155ers. And I would really like to see him move on to competitive grappling or get some kind of role inside the UFC as an ambassadorship. Because here's what I do know, Danny. He is still beloved. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you look at like the interview numbers that uh, that we did like with in the Guillermo Cruz interview, like clearly people still care about BJ Penn, right? I mean, we're talking about him right now. Um, but but I agree with you. And look, when we get on in, in front of a camera, I'm not going to sit here and lie to people and give you things and say things that I don't believe in. I think BJ Penn should retire. But look, at, at the end of the day, we can also be completely wrong about this. What if he goes in there and smokes uh, Ryan Hall? That's definitely a possibility, right? But, I mean, taking a, a good look at his previous performances, you know, it doesn't point like that's going to happen. But, you know, stranger things have happened. Sure. Um, but, you know, I'm not comfortable with BJ stepping back in the octagon. But if he is, if you absolutely must do it, at least is at 155. So, you know, he's not going to be putting his body through a drastic weight cut. Agreed. And two is against Ryan Hall. Look, Ryan Hall is a, a great fighter uh, against Gray Maynard. He displayed a very good striking, but this is not a guy that's going to go in there and just knock you out and, and cause a lot of damage in that sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, he got the perfect matchup. So uh, I am somewhat, con not not content, but look, if he's going to fight, at least he, he got you know the best possible scenario for a return. I think I agree with all that. Uh, I would say this. I think people are sleeping on Ryan's jiu-jitsu and then his yeah. round and pound because you haven't seen a whole lot of it. But I have felt his control personally. He doesn't look like some physical powerhouse, but I got to tell you, when you when you lock up with him, um, he's very strong, very strong. He's got that you know like he, that. you know what kind of strength he has. He's got that American Ninja Warrior strength. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. Well, these get you get these baristas, that weird finger strength. Yeah, like you yeah. get these dudes who look like they're in a trench coat mafia, but then they can just go across the monkey bars real fast. Yeah. He's got that kind of, man, he, he he grabs your wrist and it's hard to break it. And he's like half my size. So, yeah, yeah he's strong. Oh, I bet. But BJ is strong too. So, there you yeah, go. we'll see. I mean, at this point, it's already, you know. The ship's, it's, the fight's exactly. going to happen. Exactly. So, here we so go. At this point, let's just enjoy it. Um, now, let's switch topics and let's talk about Oscar De La Hoya and his involvement in MMA. All right. This ought to be fun. What's up, Luke Thomas? This is Steve from Central Indiana. Just sitting here watching some fight previews with my little baby daughter, trying to get you some more female fans for the future so we're bringing her up right. Thank but you. I wanted to ask a question of you guys today. I just got done watching the Ortiz uh, Liddell press conference for their third fight, and I was kind of surprised at De La Hoya's demeanor throughout the press conference. Uh, he said he was trying to be uh, an uh, em empowerment entity for the fighters instead of a competitor to the UFC. And with all the profit sharing that they are going to be having with this fight, do you think that Oscar is actually starting something positive for the sport of MMA as opposed to just answering back uh, to Dana White and the UFC for their Mayweather-McGregor fight with an Ortiz-Liddell three-bout? Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye. That's a good question. Very good question. Yeah. yeah. So he was on uh, – I had him on my radio show. We tried to get him on this one. The timing didn't work. So I had him on my radio show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I asked him that very question. I was like, how much of this, because, you know, he's a vicious competitor yes. against top rank, and, or he tries to be anyway. Uh, and, um, you know, so in the boxing space, you see that kind of thing all the time. Plus, remember those outbursts that he had prior to Mayweather McGregor. This is the worst thing ever. This, I can't believe this is not real boxing, blah, blah, blah. And uh, in the end, I actually think that that fight helped boost the profile of the uh, first Triple G Canelo fight. Mm -hmm. But this idea that this is all philanthropy is – become. let's be serious. This is clearly not true. Like what's – look, the UFC gets into trouble a little bit because they are worth 4 and $7 billion and there's a question of profit sharing. 
right? Or when Dana White tries to bring in, um, you know, I think he, the Las Vegas Review Journal reported that he had brought in, or maybe he even tweeted it on social media. You know, he brought in a snow in his house or in his driveway, so his I think kids could play with it during Christmas. So, so something like that, some sort of like true display of of, of financial he wealth. Brought Kendrick Lamar to his son's uh, okay. birthday party. Here's the truth yeah. about that: on its face, there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of that. Look, you're allowed to make profit in this country. In fact, when you make profit or I make profit, uh, usually that means people around us might be able to make profit as well. That's pro- making money. I, so, I, I don't mean to sound like Gordon Gecko, but I'm sorry, like. There is a value to to being able to earn money, particularly a lot of it. The question is how it gets distributed, and that's a separate conversation for a separate time. But I'm not mad at UFC for making money. I'm not mad at Dana White for make, for being rich. And if Oscar De La Hoya wants to make money in MMA, good. Not enough people make money inside MMA, whether it's media or fighters or whoever. So I don't know why he can't just be honest. Like, I get the pitch, right? The pitch is... Are you an, uh, hey, everybody, my name's Oscar De La Hoya. You might not know me from my uh, work inside, I do in, uh, the work that I do inside MMA, but uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, do you feel like you're underpaid? Because if you do, then I'm the guy for you. That's really what this is about. It's like a, it's a bit of a dog whistle to all the fighters out there who are unhappy with their pay. It's not, it's not a philanthropy. He's not out there. I, I just don't care about anything else other than making sure those guys are paid. Yes, he wants to get them paid because he wants enough money to come in that they get paid and he get paid. And frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand. I, I get the sales pitch, but it just seems a little silly to be like, well, what really matters to me is yeah. taking care of these fighters. No, everyone wants to get rich. Go get rich. It's fine. That's where I come down. So he asked, uh, you know, is is this fight, if, 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 are his MMA efforts good for MMA, right? So we just talked about, or you just talked about the profit section. Yeah. What about the fact of putting Ortiz and Liddell in a fight? I mean, is that good for MMA? You know, I didn't think so, but here's the reality. Like, Mayweather and Pacquiao are going to fight, and they've, you know, Pacquiao's certainly taken a ton of damage. I mean, when I saw him get flatlined by Marquez, I thought for sure that, I, I was like, did he, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not even trying to joke. I thought he died for a second. That was a vicious KO. And he's been fighting since then. Big, tough guys, too. Like, um, So in any case, he's taken a ton of damage, and, and God only knows what kind of tax bills he has to, to answer for. You know, we hear the tens of millions. But um, look, they put the fight in California. Uh, we talked about this in the MMA beat. Yep. And both those guys passed all their tests. So the, the, the central tension in here is, um, are we cynical and not realizing that these guys are much healthier than we think or certainly capable of fighting? Or are these tests worthless? And I don't have the, enough medical information to know whether these tests are worthless. So they went to the state with one of the tougher regulatory schemes in place. Mm-hmm. What can I really say, dude? I, hear, I, I think if he's successful and other fighters can get paid in the way in which he envisions, that ultimately is good. But if this is some exploitative affair where guys don't get paid the way they're supposed to, where there are uh, health risks associated with what they're doing, then in the end, it'll be a very different report card. That's true. I agree with that. By the way, real quickly, yep. Uh, did you see what Tito said this week? I did. <laughs> yes. Can I read it? Tr- Look, go ahead, read it. Well, no, no, no. I, I have a thought about that. All right, all right. Here's what he said. Someone asked him, like, uh, I forget exactly what the question was. It was, um, it, they asked him that. You know, Chuck Liddell was basically saying, like, oh, Tito just wants this fight because he's jealous of my career. Like, uh, I, I was the star, you know, in 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 that era. He was, and he was second to me. He's jealous, and and that's why he's taking this fight. Okay, here's what he says. Jealous of him. This guy can't even put an effing sentence together, man. Are you kidding me right now? He's reaching for he's reaching for those grapes. He's trying to make his wine, and the wine's already sounding like a violin with that cheese and wine. We'll see on the November 24th. Perfect sense. You know what? Yeah. Well, because to, to give a little bit of context, the, the interviewer did say, like, oh, th- this is sour grapes for me. Oh, so see, that's why that got brought up. Uh, but I have a, a few things to say about that. I know okay, go Tito ahead. Ortiz. Defend him. Uh, look, I'm not defending him. Look, everyone. I'm partially defending everyone him. Everyone clowns Tito. Yes. Whenever I go to, I've said it a thousand times, people clown Tito on social media. And then when you go to a Tito fight, the crowd is chanting his <laughs> name. It's just a I fact. I believe it. It's I just a it. fact. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because, like, Everybody gives him, you know, hate for all his little quotes and all the the little <laughs> clips that come out from his interviews, because uh, he does say some things that are off, like this, right? Like well, this doesn't make totally, much sense. This is totally but look, the the truth is that speaking on camera is extremely difficult. I mean, 
I'll, I'll just say this. We get a bunch of voicemails of people calling and we get three, four back to back calls from the same person. They just go on. They're like, hi, this is uh, and then they get all nervous and they hang up and then they do it a second time, a third time. Uh, so it's it's. I'm, I'm not defending Tito. But I feel like people think uh, being interviewed and, and, and being on camera is, is a lot easier than, than what it actually is. And sometimes you say dumb things. Look, I've said dumb things. Everybody has said dumb things. Yeah, I don't think I've said anything like that, though. Right. No way. You haven't said anything about the grapes and violin. and. To, to, to your point, you're <laughs> absolutely right. Talking on camera is hard. Yeah. I've said a number of very stupid things. Uh, I did some commentary gigs early on in my MMA career. I go back and listen to them, and they're all cringeworthy, terrible um, people have often like when I've criticized other commentators, people have often asked me, oh, what you could do better. No, no, I cannot, but I can at least make an, uh, an assessment about what is yeah. and isn't going right. But, uh, you're right. But here's the, also the point. If you have that kind of liability, limiting that liability exposure is, or limiting the exposure to that liability is kind of important. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Here's what I know. I think this fight's going to do well. I don't know how many pay-per-views it's going to sell. But people are going to be in that arena to see Tito and Chuck. So laugh it up now, but they're going to have the last one. I, I am so. very confident of that. I think it'll do well. All right, next. All right, let's keep the, the boxing MMA theme going on. All right. Hey Luke. hey, Luke. This is Carlos from Austin, Texas. And basically just wanted to ask your thoughts on, based off this weekend off the big boxing showdown, what if Connor beats Khabib? Does Connor call out Canelo? Is that even worth a... Uh, Another circus slash money fight. Want to see what your thoughts on that was? Thank you. I know it's a bit of a silly question at first, but think about it. Is it possible that McGregor hits goes back to the boxing, uh, the boxing world? Boy, that would be a real bad idea to go box Canelo. A horrible idea, but I mean, tell me that wouldn't sell. Um, it would sell. I actually feel like if he's fighting Pacquiao again, why wouldn't he fight McGregor again? Mm-hmm. Or why wouldn't even this seems less likely? Why wouldn't Mayweather fight? Not, I don't. I don't think he will because this would be a bad idea. But if you're talking about something that would be a revenue generator, Mayweather Canelo too would be a revenue generator, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, I would say uh, Canelo, no chance. That is just. I mean, you could Reaching say for the stars. Could, I mean, it was the argument was well, Mayweather's one of the best of his generation, but he's long past it, and his legs looked like they weren't there in that fight against McGregor, right? Like relative to who he used to be, anyway. Right. Um, you know, Canelo is twenty eight, bro. <laughs> Canelo's twenty eight, dude. You know what's amazing about Canelo? He's a hard hitter, which we already knew. Mm-hmm. Dude, his chin, he has a fire hydrant. Yeah. You just look at what Triple G was doing his whole career marching guys down and then sending them to the canvas like get down and just did it with pain commands he he may have barely stumbled canelo once or twice over 24 rounds that is shocking dude trust me if he wanted to make money that's a great way for mcgregor to make money that seems like a terrible idea for your health yeah what about any other matchup? Poly Malinaji? The Malinaji one is the right one to make if you want to make money and have it be reasonably competitive because you have the sparring session footage, you have all of them going back and you got forth. A story. And it's the kind of I think it's the like I think it's the kind of fight that McGregor would wouldn't mind being in, which is to say he likes the matchup itself, plus the media circus, because he just dominates the media circus. Yeah. And then to sick his fans on Malinaji, uh, either in person or on social media. And not like to attack, but I mean verbally attack, uh, dude. He he just controls the entire thing. So maybe maybe that's a way to go. Maybe. All right, now we got a request from an international fan. A request from an yes, international fan. Is it? Yep. Is okay. Let's see. Good afternoon, Luke. A little bit How are you doing? Eating. Well, this is Miguel, one of your biggest fans from Spain. Oui. And I, want, I wanted to ask you something real quick. Is Me encanta España. Can you please stop insulting my favorite football team, Barcelona? <laughs> because uh, I like listening to you and watching your podcasts, but I do it for the MMA. If you speak about football, please be respectful <laughs> with the other teams because you have very, very big fans, Barcelona fans listening to you. And, <laughs> We don't like getting like cheap shots 
in every single <laughs> podcast or program you, you or show you Ooh. you participate in. Thank you very much. Will you stop taking cheap shots well, at Barcelona? Okay, it's a good question, Danny. Now let me pitch this one back to you, and uh -huh. here's why. Now we hate each other on game day because we both cheer for rival teams from the same city. That is correct. But here is the one thing we have in common. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm -hmm. We also both hate Barcelona. So what would you do? <laughs> well, I don't really take... I respect Barcelona. I respect I respect. Bar I respect you can Messi. respect and hate somebody at the same time. But, I, you know, is that my hatred for Real Madrid is so big? You that, hate Real more than Barcelona? Yeah. Hell yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So well, that's a tough cross to bear. Well, Supercopa champion, so oh <laughs> I'm still holding this on to pre season that. win you yeah, love to talk hey, about. Hey, we haven't been doing too well in the season, so I can't probably talk much. Yeah, hashtag Celta Vigo. Don't yeah. think I didn't see that game. Anyway, oh, what should I do? What's the right call here? Because I don't want to piss off people yeah. who like the show and like me, because there's mm -hmm. about five people who like me in the world, uh, which I understand and I'm okay with. But if I don't have to make enemies unnecessarily, what do I do? Do I just stop talking about Barcelona on the show at all? Barcelona? No, look, I, I think maybe this this caller, because, um, you know, a lot of people think when you hate on someone, you ac you automatically do not respect them. No, no, I respect I, Barcelona. I think it's I think it's fine to hate on, on, on any other team that's not yours, but, you know, dude, throw it out, put, put it out there. You know, you, you respect Barcelona. Dude, you know? every, maybe, every time there's El Clasico, your boy is sweating bullets. Every yeah. time. Every time. Every time. Uh, Dangerous team, and they're looking good, man. Yeah, they're they're look, they always really look. They good. always look good. Yeah. You know how much it made me sick to my stomach when I was in Barcelona on my vacation, having to go around, and I, we we took. A, you ever do those? Um, you ever do those? Uh, hop on, hop off bus tours. Uh, yes, I did that in. I didn't do that in Barcelona. No? I did that in Italy. So here's why I always recommend: if you ever travel to Europe, they're cheap. They're like thirty bucks a ticket or less, and yeah. you can get them also until like two days. I always get the hop on, hop off bus tour. Any city I go to, it's the first thing I do because it's just an easy way to see the city. And they uh, they stopped by the Camp New on the tour. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I had- Did you get sick? I had automatically, out of, you know what's amazing? Out of nowhere, I just laid eyes on Camp New and then I had explosive diarrhea right away. <laughs> oh man. I don't know how that happened. I, uh... I don't know if there's a correlation between the two. Yeah. I, I don't know, but it seemed like the events were related. But dude, everywhere, like you want to talk about people who rep their team in a city. Oof. I've never been, you can go like, the only equivalent would be here in New York, all the people who wear Yankees caps. You know how Yankees caps are like the universal cap or something? Yeah. Uh, it's about like that. You go to Barcelona, bro, and they rep hard. Yeah, it's more team. than a team. Yeah. Mesque un club. Yep. All right. All right. So now let's talk about uh, Habib uh, and Connor. And this this was an interesting question. Also, I, I really uh, lastly, like sorry, lastly. Yeah. Hala Madrid. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, Patleti. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, it's Matt from New York. I want to know what's more likely. Connor submitting Khabib or Khabib, Khabib uh, knocking out Connor. Thank you very much. Ooh, and not, not ground and pound on the feet, right? I think that's what this caller you know, So you have to be very careful with these kinds of things. So remember when Mac Danzig fought Mark Bocek. Do you remember that? Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know their resumes, Mac Danzig was always a very good fighter, very well-rounded, very good on the ground. But Mark Bocek was maybe one of the premier Canadian talents in sport jiu-jitsu, much less inside the UFC. Like, like as good as Mac Danzig was, uh, Mark Bocek, pure jiu-jitsu, way better. And then Mark Bocek, over time, had shown a propensity for adapting his jiu-jitsu for MMA purposes. So I remember in the outset when the, that weekend... Uh, they're like, predictions for the fight, Luke. And I'm like, I don't know who's going to win, or I, I forget who I picked. But I was like, there's no way on planet Earth that Mark Bocek is going to get submitted by Mac Danzig. And sure enough, he did. And the reason why was not because necessarily it was jujitsu for jujitsu and he just beat him. It was because he beat him up to the point where he was able to use what jujitsu he had, which again was very, very good. And I think he took his back, pounded him out, and then maybe choked him out, something like that. Uh, and that was just one of those lessons. So here's the point. If Habib can knock – Habib, yes, can knock Connor out in the feet. And, yes, Connor can absolutely sub uh, Habib. These things are absolutely possible given a variety of other circumstances that have to take place. 
So I would say his question was, Danny, if I recall correctly, which one is more likely? Yep, correct. Right, which one is more likely? I would say it's more likely it's more likely that Habib knocks out Connor on the feet, yeah. which is to say not likely at all. But I can see a case where Connor's getting thrashed, makes it to the end of a round, gets up, and remember how remember how tired he looked, Danny, in that Mayweather yes. fight, where yep. he was just like stumbling around, almost looked drunk because he had no energy. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, where he's not much of a striking threat, I can see Habib going after him on the feet. I can see. I don't think it's likely. That's not how I see the fight going. But for Connor to submit Habib again, it could be uh, could be possible. But for that to happen, they have to be on the ground, right? If yeah. they're on the ground, dude, Connor's got devastating ground and pound. He doesn't have like this, this avalanche of attack, but what he does have is super precise, mm -hmm. hard shots, dude, that turns guys' belly down. It makes them cover up. It makes them go to sleep. So to me, if they're on the ground, Habib's going to get ground and pound if it's going, you know, for Connor. Yeah. And on the feet, I just see, uh, again, terribly unlikely but i can at least imagine that happening before habib getting submitted yeah 100 percent. i i have to agree with that and even if like let's say connor for some reason you know wobbles habib and and it, ha it has the opportunity to sink in a submission on the ground like a lot of submissions you know they they put you in a certain position where you may be giving up a uh, position right if you don't get it and I don't think Connor's willing to take that gamble. Connor is a really, really smart fighter. I don't think he's gonna drop for a guillotine, just even if Habib is super hurt, just because like there is a chance that he might get out and well, he's now on bottom. Yeah. And that that is hell. So I, I would I would agree with uh with your statement. I think Habib knockout is probably the most likely one. Again, well, given the two scenarios. Right. Which is to say also not very likely. <laughs> not, not very, very likely. likely either. Yeah. All right, let's uh keep the Connor Habib train rolling. All right, let's do it. And uh, this is another important point that another fan brings up that we didn't, at least me personally, didn't really think about. What's up, Luke? Andy from Connecticut. Wondering, I hear a lot of scenarios going around. If Connor wins, who he can match up with. If Connor loses, who he can match up with. Haven't heard anyone talked about the immediate rematch. Any chance Connor loses and plants his feet and gets a second title shot? against Khabib? Okay. Interesting question. I hadn't thought much about it. I'll say this. Um, huh. That's a good one. I would say uh, if the end is, if there's a split decision, 100%. If there is some kind of referee error or the referee gets involved in a way where folks feel like the result isn't as legitimate as it should be, 100%. If the fight is competitive tooth and nail uh, and folks think the wrong guy won, even if, again, so for example, people think Triple G won, I did, but he didn't. Uh, but you can make a case for, you know, either guy, that scenario. But if somebody gets wiped, I mean, they've done these before, like the guest, I don't know if we're going to get, you want AJ check at this point, I don't know what the hell's happening, but uh, remember she lost to Rose Namajunas and then back to back mm -hmm. she fought Rose Namajunas. But she was the champion. She was the champion, so it changed things. I'm just pointing out they'll, they'll do that two times in a row. So, but let's say Habib gets smashed. Do they do it again? Maybe, maybe because well, let's say he goes into the fight injured. Oh, I had a busted rib, I had a broken ankle, or something in those scenarios. But if it's like a normal fight, like 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 for example, if it, let's say it looks like the Alvarez fight, if it looks like the Connor versus Alvarez fight, hard to know what the purpose or value or frankly the upside would be of doing it back to back at that point it would seem gratuitous and unnecessary especially Danny where if Connor's back and he looks that good or something was right then you got Tony Ferguson waiting out there you got a lot of different possibilities you got Nate Diaz waiting out there you would need a very compelling reason to supersede those things yeah I I would say the Diaz I believe is a big factor in this because if, if Connor loses is bad, he can still have that third Diaz fight and make a lot of money, right? Like, he doesn't need Habib. He doesn't even, frankly, need the title, to be honest. Uh, and I don't think Nate Diaz wants the shot at the title either. So he would rather take Conor coming off a loss than take a shot at the title, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I think if that's the case, we'll not see a, a rematch. But if there's any little doubt, any type of controversy, whether it's a referee or decision, or even or even if this decision's correct, and it was just a competitive fight, you know, like it wasn't a wipeout. I can for sure see Connor. Look, I can do better than this. Uh, 
you know, this wasn't me that night, rematch, and you could absolutely sell that rematch, even if it's a fair decision. All right. What do we want to do about Yuana? You want to give her another try? Um, sure. Yeah. Let me give her a call. If not, we still have a few questions we can tackle. All right. Uh, we'll we'll see what the word is there. I'll, uh, okay. I'll wait for you. Let me know in my ears, please. Once you Okay. For that. sure. So hopefully we can get her on and then we'll do that. I guess we'll see. Uh, as always, by the way, you can submit your calls using our email address. I think a bunch of them must've come that way. The MMA hour at voxmedia.com, not MMA hour at voxmedia.com. The MMA Hour at VoxMedia.com. And, of course, you can also call the hotline at any time, 844-866-2468. Two great ways to get in touch with us. And, of course, you already know about the tweets using the hashtag The MMA Hour. So three ways, really two and a half, but three ways you can get in touch with us and be a part here of the sound of. I always love doing the calls. At some point, I like to do them live. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out down the road. Um, taking calls is one of my favorite things to do. It's one of the most important things I think to do. Really, if you think about it, like taking calls or even live calls or even voice messages, it's like the original social media, right? You re you say something, people react, you go back and forth to that, um, and this is sort of like real meaningful interaction at times. I, I I like that. I really that's one of my favorite things to do. A little bit hard to 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 um, to do given some limitations, right? A lot of people get nervous calling or. Um, you know, not every topic is call worthy, but certainly one of my favorite things to do. Uh, hope we can get Misty and Jacek here. Uh, if not, we'll finish up with some calls and, uh, that'll be that. So did y'all see her interaction with the reporter over the weekend? That was a little odd, right? That was a little weird. Um, but it was hard to tell if that reporter was like fishing, fishing for her to say something negative on purpose, in which case. You know, you, sh you shouldn't be doing that. But at the same time, I don't really feel like it's off limits to ask those questions. So it was it was a it was, it was in that middle space where it was a little bit hard to tell what was up, and what was down. Um, but uh, hopefully we can get a chance to ask her here and we'll see how that goes. Um, let me see what else. Anything I'm forgetting from the weekend? Uh, of course, Eric Anders shouts to Eric Anders for doing a phenomenal job. Winning his last fight, getting right back on the horse, going right back to Brazil. Uh, I feel bad for Jimmy Manoa. I don't know what happened there, but taking on Tiago Santos, man, Eric Anders is a beast. We were talking about the MMA beat, excuse me, yes, the MMA beat, how he had this great momentum going into the Leota Machida fight, doesn't win, and it got real quiet. Well, then he got that last win that was great, and then he can go down to Brazil and get another one back to back like that. Well, he can he can resume the kind of trajectory. I think that he was on before, uh, which would be phenomenal to see. All right, do we have any resolution, Danny, or what? Yes, no? Oh, look, it's 155. I mean, you know, we're out of time. We got to move on. You know, what are we going to do? Let's just move on, all right? We can't, you know, I, I got things to do. I don't know what happened. I apologize. Sometimes we have guests, and then sometimes things happen. What are you going to do? Let's do some more questions, and then we'll call it a day. It's kind of weird that we have these guests, and then at the last minute, they keep falling through. It's a little hard to understand why this keeps happening, but... Yeah, it's always hard to schedule and manage live things, right? Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. Difficult. Yeah, certainly ha certainly been interesting here. Yeah. Uh, okay, any more calls, please? Um. Okay, so t -t 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 you want to talk about, about bantamweight division or about champions overall? We got two different questions here. Ooh, uh, you know what? It's your birthday. Your you poison. can pick birthday, boy. Okay, sure. I'm going to go with the more interesting one. So uh, here we <laughs> well, go. Why did you just say that from the get-go? Well, it depends. What, what might be interesting to me might not be interesting to you. Yeah, we right? usually copacetic in that regard. All right, go ahead. Hey, Danny. Hey, Luke. Welcome back. This is Angel Hollywood from South Florida. So my question is, with Montano being stripped and stating that it was partly for her not being a draw, should Woodley and other champions who are not a draw be in fear of also being stripped of their belts? Great question. What it a, is what a, a fantastic question. Phenomenal. Dude, the questions the last two weeks on the phone, dude, they've been rock solid they've been fuego rock solid uh you know what i have made this point and people have dismissed it they have laughed at it they have said there's no way but when you create all these interim titles and then you take them away and then there's this creep into the space of the champion now again i'm not saying there's no good case for stripping nico montano 
Champion shows up and doesn't even weigh in. That's a problem in some regard to her responsibility needs to be paid. At the same time, you can't think about the broader con- you can't ignore rather the broader context here, which is that there's just uneven application of justice. There's really no rules. A lot of this was done probably to facilitate getting the belt towards Valentina Shevchenko anyway. There's just a lot of things that are that are not considerations about the about the infraction in question. And I think as you begin to devalue titles generally, and as you begin to find reasons to take titles, first interim, now full-on flyweight, do I think Tyron Woodley is in jeopardy of losing his title? No, I do not. Um, I still think that there is a lot of value to that and a lot of protection that comes with that title. But if these guys think they're immune, they are very much mistaken. Yeah, I feel like the Nico one was a very specific and special situation. I don't, I don't think we'll get a lot of those cases uh, in the future, if if any. But it does bring up a flag. Like if you're a champion and let's say you're not a huge draw, and little things happen where you get injured or you're in, unable to fight for whatever reason, like there could be a chance, right? It's not far fetched to just think, hey, they might just strip me. So uh, it is, it is kind of worrisome, right? If you if you're a champion and you're not a top draw. Anything else? One more? Then we'll call it a day. One more. All right, let's go to the other one. Let's do it. Hey, what's going on, Danny and Luke? This is Craig calling from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I just had a question. With uh, the bantamweight division being held up, I want to know what you guys' thoughts were on Aljo versus Dominic Cruz. You know, he called him out after the fight. I'd like to see that more than him versus Jimmy, Re- uh, Jimmy Rivera. And uh, Aljo looks great. I mean, worst case scenario, Aljo beats... Dominic, and then he's right in this, you know, shot for a title. And if Dominic beats him, then it's a warm-up fight he needs to uh, get a shot at the title. So uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think. Thanks. What do you think of his of his call out uh, in that matchup? First of all, to be done. First of all, shouts to Aljamain Sterling, who, you know, you talk about guys getting better and better, and then I think a lot of times analysts overstate things. I don't think you can overstate that with Aljo. The last fight, he's had two wins since the bad loss to Moresh. Mm-hmm. He had the Brett Johns win and then this most recent one. And I thought to myself, you know what, man? His striking to me for the first, it's always been decent to good. This time I thought it was great. And yeah. more importantly, it was just fluid and instinctual and it just went. I really, really like what he had to show. To me, it's a smart call out. Dom does not appear to be all that interested. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but just mm-hmm. based on the reaction, it doesn't seem like that's the one he wants. I don't know what they're doing because you have Henry Cejudo out there over the weekend kind of hinting that the fight with TJ Dillashaw is going to happen, like some flyweight, bantamweight um, you know, meeting of the minds. If that's the way they go, I guess that's the way they go. I would have liked to see Marlon Moraes or even Asun Sao get a title shot. Yeah, but, that would be nice. But if they're going to do Cejudo versus Dillashaw, that frees up Marais to fight Cruz if that's what they wanted to do. It just seems like Cruz doesn't want to do that. But if you're asking me, do I like the fight? I love the fight, and I really li- I really have a strong appreciation for the growth that Aljamain Sterling has been able to show. Yeah, and a lot of fighters have would have a hard time coming back from that knockout. That was a bad knockout, man. Yep. And uh, he's been able to look sharp, and not only that, but keep improving. And, so and not and not gun shy at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm all for him getting a, a step up in competition if that means Dominic Cruz. But I doubt that fight happens, to be honest. Who do you think Dominic Cruz fights by the by when it's all said and done? I feel like Dominic Cruz is at a space right now that if he really wants and he doesn't get the shot next, he can really sit out and he'll eventually get it. I mean, he is uh, one of the bigger names in a division. Uh, you know, he's still very skilled. So I, I honestly don't see him fighting anybody but for the title. All right. Uh, As an interim or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay.